the light's purpose. In an image, each light source has a particular purpose or job in the scene. Is it the main light source creating the overall mood in the shot? Or is the light being used to help so the subject doesn't blend in with the background? Or is the light being used so the shadows aren't quite so dark? Understanding what each light does in a scene helps you give that light a purpose. You have to give it a job to reach the end goal of your shot. So let's take a look at the different roles a light source may play in a scene, and we are going to learn the terminology and then build in some examples together. Key light. Also known as the main light, the key light is the light source in the scene that makes up the primary illumination on your subject. Typically, the exposure of an image is based on your key light. The key light usually sets the overall tone and the quality of the light and the mood of the scene. A key light or main light can be a studio strobe, the sun, a window, or various other light sources. Fill light. A fill light is used to control the shadows by filling in or opening up the shadow areas. A fill light could be a reflector, a strobe, or another lighting tool. Rim light. Typically, it's a backlight source that creates a highlight on the subject, sometimes the jaw, the hair, the shoulder, or another part of the body. This highlight creates an outline on the part of the subject to draw attention to that area or to help separate the subject from the background. This is sometimes known as a kicker light because the light kicks the subject out from the background. A rim light can also be known as a hair light when it's illuminating the hair, and there can be multiple rim lights in a single scene. Background light. This light is used to illuminate the background behind the subject, and typically it's used to create either visual interest or separation so that your subject isn't blending in with the background. A background light may also be used to change the color of the background. In a photograph, you may have a single strobe or multiple strobes plus reflectors. Each and every single light has a purpose it's there. So you're not just setting up the lights willy-nilly hoping it looks good. You give each light a job. Let's build a shot together so you can see how all of these different lighting purposes, jobs, work together in tandem. Now what we're going to do is take a look at the purpose of each of these lights. I'm gonna give each light a job, a role in my scene. And anytime I'm shooting, I'm thinking about if I add a light, what is it doing? What's its purpose? How is it adding to this photo? More doesn't always mean better, but sometimes more can give you more control. So we're gonna start with our main light. And so the main light in this scene, the only light we have on right now is uh, in this case, an octobox. Now, when I am working with a main light, I know that that main light is going to control the mood of the scene. So if I pull it off further to the side, like we talked about with direction of light, I can get more drama from the scene, more dramatic shadows. Um, or I can change the mood by changing the quality of light. So right now it's nice and soft because of the octobox, but I could change it to a zoom reflector or something that's a little bit more focused, something that's uh, more harsh. So this is the main source of light on my subject. It controls a lot of that mood and the quality of light. This is what I'm basing my exposure off of. So let me get that first shot with just the main light on. Okay, great. So in this case, I've gotten a little bit of drama. I have a loop shadow. It's a little bit of sculpting to the face and softer light. That's what I've chosen for my main light. All right, but the next thing I can do is I can then decide what do I do about those shadows? Taking a look at the shadows, maybe I think that they're a bit dark for my goals. And so the next light I can introduce into the scene or the next light source would be a fill light. So it's going to open up those shadows. I can either fill them in so they aren't so dark or depending on what I choose, I can, I can change what they look like. And we're gonna talk about that more later. I can change the quality by using a harder light source or a softer light source or depending on the reflector that I choose. So in this case, I'm actually going to add a reflector, not another light source. It is a light source because of the way it's bouncing, uh, but it doesn't mean I need another strobe. So I'm going to add my reflector. And this is great because I don't need an assistant if I've got this arm. This arm is made by Westcott. And so you'll see it's gonna open up, fill in those shadows. And this is a white reflector as my fill light. All right, so comparing these two shots, you see that bringing in the reflector opens up the shadows. It, it, it fills them in a little bit. So, so far I have my main light. It controls the mood of the shoot, the amount of shadows, the quality of the light, all of that. And then I have my second purpose, my second job here, which is the reflector. In this case, a white reflector, which is my fill light, filling in the shadows. So now the next purpose of a light, the next job is going to be my rim light. 
And so in this case, I picked one of the most common modifiers for rim light, which is a strip softbox. And so what this is going to do is I've placed it on the left-hand side of the frame, and it's going to give me a highlight on the side of the neck, on the side of the head, and on the shoulder, which separates the subject from the background. So let's add this light into the scene. All right, and let me grab a quick shot so I can show you what I'm looking for. All right, so you get that nice and defined rim light. Now, in the case of this subject, uh, she doesn't have hair, but if I raise the light up higher, it's still a rim light, but it could also be called a hair light because of that, that highlight on the top of the head. Uh, now, a rim light could be used, if you want some more of that, that like commercial look, that pop, uh, a lot of photos that you'll see of professional athletes or movie posters, they use rim lights a lot. It gives it a higher production value, uh, and, and you also see it a lot in composites. In this case, I've used the rim light just to pop her out from the background a little bit. So we've got our main light, our fill light, our rim light, and then the last job is going to be a background light. Now this is anything that's used to light the background. In this case, what I have is I've got a strobe on the right hand side here, and I've got a grid. Grid focuses the light, so it's gonna give me a little bit of a halo of light. That's just to demonstrate here, but I, I could have it be bare bulb and just light the entire background. So let's add in our background light. Great. And let me grab a quick shot so you can see what I'm looking at. Okay, great. So you'll notice that this background light, in this case, it's, it's pretty subtle, but it gives you a nice halo because the main goal of a background light can be to change the tonality of the background, right? If you want it to be lighter, or maybe you want a gradient like we have here, or you could add color for a gel. But usually what I'm trying to do is either add some interest, which the background does have a little bit more depth to it, or separate the subject out from the background. That little halo helps pop the subject out so the photo doesn't look as two-dimensional. I absolutely do not need to use all of these things in a single shot. I don't need to have a rim light and a fill light and a background light. I can pick and choose, but you should know when you add a light to the scene, what is the purpose? What is the goal? Why are you adding that light or that reflector? More about rim lights. All right, so now what I wanna do is I wanna demonstrate uh, a couple of things that I think about when I'm placing my rim light, choosing my modifier. There's a lot more to consider than just point something at the side of a subject's head. Uh, so first of all, let's talk about the modifiers. There are two modifiers that are used most commonly as rim lights. The first one you'll see on the left, which is a strip softbox. And strip softboxes come in a lot of different sizes. Uh, there's some that are very small, there's one by three, one by four, one by six. So some of them are even full length on a subject. Now, the larger that strip softbox is, it's going to give you more coverage, a longer highlight on your subject, or as we've talked about with the cone of light, if you back that rim light up a bit, it'll also give you more coverage and give a longer highlight on your subject. Now, what's nice about a strip softbox is it's, it's a little bit easier to use um, compared to just using a bare bulb, for example, you're less likely to get lens flare. And also because it is a softbox, uh, how it's built is in the inside, there's an inner baffle. Basically, there's a piece of diffusion. And so the light hits that diffusion and spreads out. And then that light that's now spread out hits the front piece of diffusion on that strip softbox and it fills the softbox. So what it does is it gives you a larger light source. And a larger light source not only gives you more coverage for the highlight, but a larger softbox also gives you softer light. So you're going to get a softer, more wrapping highlight. I find this particularly useful if I'm choosing a rim light, say on uh, somebody with, with texture on their face, whether it's uh, pimples or pores or even five o'clock shadow. If I choose a harder modifier, what ends up happening is the light hitting the side of their face actually emphasizes that texture, whereas the strip softbox is a little more gentle. It's a little softer. So uh, my recommendation for the size of strip softbox depends on your space. Right, because a one by six, for example, might be really impractical if you're shooting in a space with low ceilings. The other modifier that is used very, very often is something called barn doors. And barn doors is what you will see to the right-hand side of the frame. And what barn doors are, is they, they have these leaves in front, these doors that allow you to open and close them to widen the beam or narrow the beam. 
But if you look at what barn doors are, it's actually just a bare bulb with these doors in front of it. So it's a very hard light source. It's a small light source, a hard light source. And what it does is it emphasizes texture. It, because it's hard, it gives you a more abrupt transition. So I use this whenever I want really hard, crisp rim light. Like I want a really narrow line on the side of the subject's arm or on their jawline. So these are some of the ways I'm trying to pick which modifier I want. If I want a highlight that's really focused, that's really crisp, that's really narrow, I usually opt for barn doors. However, there is a downside. Uh, one of the downsides is because it's hard light, it does emphasize texture, so texture on the side of the face. But the other thing is if you look at the spread of light, you'll often notice with barn doors that it'll be very, very hot, uh, maybe on the side of the temple. And then by the time it gets to the arm, it kind of this gets a little, uh, a little dimmer. And then maybe you get a hot spot on the shoulder but it's not going to give me nice, even illumination head to toe. So if I would like to have even highlights to separate my subject from the background, I go with a strip soft box. But if I want something narrower, a little more crisp with more control, sometimes I'll go for barn doors. So which one's right for you? Um, one of the things I think you could do is you could actually make your own. If you're, if you're just starting off building your kit and you don't want to buy another rim light, uh, you can make your own barn doors to start off with. So. What I have here is my homemade barn doors. This is something called Cinefoil, C-I-N-E-F-O-I-L. And what it is, it's thick black tin foil, but it's actually made for this purpose. It's usually for theater lighting. And what I can do is I can gaff tape it, gaffer's tape, to the side of a zoom reflector, or honestly, even to the bare bulb of your strobe. And I can use it to create doors that I can open and close so I can narrow the beam or make it wider. So if you're first starting out and you don't want to buy something special for your rim light, this might be a good way to go. That being said, for most portrait photographers, I think the direction I would recommend to start off with is probably the strip softbox because it's a little bit softer, because it's a little bit more even. And so often for portraits, it's going to give you uh, closer to what you're looking for out of a rim light. So I've described these to you the strip soft box, the barn doors, the do-it-yourself barn doors, but let's take a look at these rim lights in action so you can compare the two and see the pros and cons and then figure out what's better for you. Right now, I don't have my main light on, just the two rim lights in the back. So let's grab a shot. Okay, so let's take a look at these two rim lights. Again, on the left, I have the strip soft box, on the right, the barn doors. And where I've placed them is when I was setting this up, I placed them at a similar distance from the subject from the, where the actual bare bulb is, um, and a similar angle. So I have a similar amount of wrap on the neck. Now, if you look at this shot, the two rim lights aren't drastically different. And so, so one thing you should notice is whatever you have to start off with is probably going to be good enough to do the job. But I actually do see some differences. So first of all, if we zoom in and look very, very close, if you look at the transitions, on the uh, highlight to shadow on the neck, on, on the rim light there, you will actually see a difference in texture. The barn doors emphasize the texture. And guess what? She has no texture to her skin. It's perfectly smooth. So if it's emphasizing texture there, imagine with someone who actually has a skin texture. Uh, you'll also notice that the transition is a little bit more abrupt. Okay, so it's a little bit sharper, a little bit sharper transition on the jawline, for example, whereas the strip soft box wraps around a little bit more. Another thing that you will notice is that the highlight is much more even on the side with the strip softbox. It's got a similar illumination, a similar wrap on the temple, the side of the jaw and the neck. But if you look at the barn doors, that's not the case. It's a little brighter on the temple. And then when you get to the upper part of the shoulder, you don't see much light at all. And then there's a little highlight on the shoulder. So what my point is, is again, strip softbox will give you more even, but I can get a little harder, a little sharper with the barn doors. Let's take a look though, if I modify these barn doors, if I change them, I'm gonna keep the angle the same, the position the same, the distance, the power, all of that, but I'm going to narrow the door. So you can see the difference that it does make and why sometimes I choose this modifier. All right, so let me close the barn doors a bit, just to give me a very, very narrow highlight. All right, and let's take another shot. Okay. So if you take a look now, what I've done is 
I've narrowed that beam of light. It's not wrapping quite around as much and it's a little bit harder. So what's great with barn doors is I didn't have to change the modifier or the angle. I just open and close the doors and it gives me that control. So we've seen how closing and opening the barn doors can help me narrow the beam of light. But another thing I like about these barn doors is actually that, that bottom door, it, it's great for controlling the light if I'm getting spill on the ground or lower on the body where I don't want it to be. So I can actually come back here and I can control the spread of light top to bottom as well. It's going to be a little bit harder to do that with a strip soft box. Uh, and I can use something called flags, but we'll talk about that at another point. All right, so you see what the barn door looks like. Now let's look at my DIY barn door with the cinefoil so you can see how I could utilize that as well. All right, so I'm gonna switch this out. Okay. And I'm gonna narrow my beam again. Take another shot. Great. Basically the shot before was just a little bit brighter, but now that I've done the DIY barn doors, you can see very little difference. Just a couple of things to note if you do make your own barn doors, uh, don't do this out of cardboard and uh, say duct tape because both of those things are not intended to be on hot strobes. And so I speak from experience when I've actually had something like smoke up and, and get a little flame because I went with duct tape and cardboard and didn't realize the side effects. So go for cinefoil and gaffer's tape. That's what's intended to be put on lights when you're creating your DIY modifiers. The next thing that I wanna talk about is the placement of the rim lights, both the height and then compared to where your subject is, because that makes a big difference in what the rim lights look like. But before I do that, you will notice that although I have a main light, I have that main light turned off. And one of the reasons I do this is when I have the main light turned on, sometimes I find that I'm not paying close enough attention to the placement of the rim lights. So when I'm doing a shoot using rim lights, I turn off my main light to start off with, or I might get it in place, then turn it off, and then I place my rim lights because I can see, well, how exactly is it hitting the jawline? How far is it wrapping around? So let me take a shot real quick with the main light on and off just so you can see how it's, it's obviously easier to tell when you turn off that main light. So let me take one shot with the main light off. And now let me turn that light on. Perfect. So I can clearly still see the rim lights, but I don't know, my brain just wasn't trained like that. So I do better when I can focus on one thing at a time. If you go behind the scenes with me in a shoot, you'll see that's often what I do. I go through each light and I get it in place, I build it, and then I take a look at how it's all working together as a whole because each light has a purpose and I wanna make sure it's fulfilling its purpose and I'm paying attention to exactly what that light is doing. Okay, so now let's take a look. I'm gonna turn off my main light and we're gonna look at the placement of the rim lights. So let me turn that main light off one more time. Okay. All right, so first of all, let's talk about the height of the light. When I'm placing a rim light on a subject, what I usually aim to do is have that center of the light even with or above the shoulder. And the reason is, is when it's below shoulder level, it's actually hitting up on the body and I usually don't get that nice highlight on the top of the shoulder and the jawline. And I actually get these weird up highlights that tends to actually make the face look a little bit wider. It's usually not doing what I'm aiming for that rim light to do. Typically, I aim for it to be shoulder height or above, but I am willing to go even higher when I intend for that rim light to actually be a hair light. If I raise the light up and tilt it down, I can get it to wrap around the top of the head. So let me change the angle of the light just a little bit so you can see this in action. All right, so let me get a, a standard shot. All right, so now let's lower the light first. Okay, so this is if it were below shoulder level. And you'll see you're gonna get that, that up light on the jawline. Now it's not terrible, but you'll also notice you don't have the same even light on the shoulder. So now I'm gonna raise it up to shoulder level and then above shoulder level. So let's go. 
That's just about shoulder level there. And I'm not basing it on the entire modifier. I'm just lining up where the head is. So that's good. Now you can see I've got a little bit more of the highlight on the top of the shoulder. And now I'm gonna raise it up even more and turn it so I'm actually getting a hair light as well. At this higher angle, you see how the light starts to wrap around the head as well as completely illuminate the top of the shoulder. But if we shot full length, you're not going to have that nice even highlight down the body. So you have to kind of pick and choose what your goals are. A little lower, more even to shoulder will give you nice and even head to toe. If you go up a little bit higher, it's going to wrap around the head, but maybe not reach uh, the highlight on the lower part of the body. So, so far we've seen how the height of the rim light makes a difference and exactly where it's illuminating on the body. but the angle of the rim light in relationship to your subject makes a really big difference. It can make the rim light look really narrow or you can make it so it wraps more around the face. Here's how I think about it. When you have your subject, the further back behind your subject that rim light is, the narrower it's going to be. And the reason is it's basically from that back angle, all the light is hitting the back of the subject. So you're only seeing a sliver of light. But the further you bring it out around to the side, the more it wraps around and eventually it's not even a rim light anymore. Eventually it becomes a side light or a fill light. So I use the angle of the light to control just how wide that rim light is. Let's take a look at that in action. So I'm gonna start with my rim light kind of in that back 30 to 45 degree angle. Let me get that set and we're gonna move it around so you can see the difference and then apply that same difference when you're trying to figure out how to control the width of your rim light. So let's start at a back 45 degree angle-ish behind my subject. This is gonna give me the narrowest beam possible. Okay, nice narrow highlight. And now let me bring it around more. I'm gonna bring it up around the side of my subject a bit. You notice when I flip between the two, it gets a little bit wider so that, that rim light isn't quite as narrow. It gets wider around the subject. Let me move it even more. You can see a drastic difference. What you'll notice now is in that move, now it's wrapping around and lighting basically half of the side of the cheeks of the subject. My advice to you is this, usually with rim lights, you don't wanna bring it around that far because when you get to this point, it actually makes the subject's face look wider because you're lighting so much of it, you're making that highlight. It, it's not emphasizing the jawline anymore, it's actually making the face look wider. The other thing that I, I really try to avoid when possible is what you see in this photo is you actually see a highlight on the nose. And now when you are taking a photograph, your eye goes to the brightest parts of the photograph. So your eye might go to the subject's face or it might go see a little bit of a rim light, which would be great uh, for maybe a fitness shot where you wanna emphasize the muscles. But in this point, in this example, that highlight on the nose is going to create a problem because it's going to make the brightest or brighter part of the face, the nose. And so you're just going to be looking at that over and over again. And it's usually not flattering. So when I'm setting my rim lights, what I try to watch for is I try to control uh, the movement from side to side, not only to control how wide that rim light appears on the subject's face and body, but also to control just to the point before it hits the nose. I don't find that flattering. So as I flip through these shots, each time I move the light up, it wraps around more and more. And eventually when you move the light all the way up to the front, as you can see, it just becomes a side light. It's not even a rim light anymore. Rim lights, lens flare. All right, so now it's time to do a little bit of problem solving around using rim lights. If you've used rim lights before, you've probably noticed that very often you run into a problem with lens flare. And lens flare fundamentally is when light is hitting your lens and it bounces around and it creates a, a little flare or a little bit of haze. Fortunately, there are many different things you can do to try to problem solve to remove this lens flare in camera without Photoshop. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run you through the many different elements that will allow you to reduce or completely eliminate that lens flare and camera, even if you're shooting in a very small space. Now, the first thing that you do have to consider is, is your lens dirty? If your lens is dirty, take a lens cloth, wipe it off, because what happens is if a little light is hitting it and it catches a smudge from your finger or a little bit of dust, it's likely to create that flare. So that's the first thing you should do. Now let's take a shot at the, of the setup we have here. I know I have lens flare and let's see what I can do to reduce it. All right, so let me grab a shot first. All right. Well, the first thing that I notice is I've got a lot more lens flare on the right hand side of the frame compared to the left. Well, on the right hand side, all we do is we have, we have a bare bulb so that light is kicking everywhere and it's hitting the lens and it's giving me flare. But on the left hand side, there's only a little bit from that softbox. Anytime you add a modifier or something that restricts the spread of light, it's going to help you out with lens flare. Let's say that you're using a strip softbox and you're still getting a little bit of flare. Something you can do is add a grid. Grids restrict or they focus your beam of light and they have grids that fit directly on the lights. They have grids for soft boxes. They have grids for beauty dishes. They have grids for everything, including strip soft boxes. Adding a grid to your strip soft box prevents the light from spreading out so much. It focuses it, which has several benefits. One of the ways it might benefit you is if you're shooting in a small space, adding that grid will prevent some of the light from bouncing off the walls, which might fill in your shadows. It also narrows the beam of light so that you don't have lens flare or you don't have as much lens flare. So let me show you what that grid looks like. When you're working with soft boxes, your grid is going to be made out of fabric and it will, go, it will fit in the front of that strip soft box. Even just adding this, this is going to narrow the beam just enough that it might help with a little bit of flare created by those strip soft boxes. Next on our lineup of ways to help fix lens flare is the angle of light. The further you have the light in behind your subject and the more that light is pointed right back at your lens, that's when you're going to get the most flare. So if you can do something to move the light off to the side and then feather it back in towards the subject instead of straight at your lens, that's going to reduce some of the flare. So let me take this backlight. Let me grab that shot again. Okay. Tons of flare. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to move it out to the side a bit and feather it in. So away from my camera's lens. So let's see if that's helped. All right. So if you look at that, what you've got is you've got very minimal lens flare, just a little bit of haze. I can tell, however, that I am getting some spill on the background. So what is the next thing that I can do? I've moved it out to the side. It helped a lot, but it didn't get rid of everything. From there, there's a couple of things I can do. I can either add a modifier or block the light from hitting my lens. So let's first start with the modifier. And in this case, I'm going to go with barn doors, which could be do it yourself or the barn doors I have here. So by adding my barn doors, I can still allow the light to hit my subject, but I can close the barn door and block it off my lens. And what's interesting is I can see the front of my lens. And right now I actually see a highlight on the lens. But when I close the barn door, I know exactly where I need to close it to reduce that lens flare. And then if I'm getting any light hitting the background, I can also close this barn door to prevent any unwanted light. So it's not like I have to narrow my beam too much. I'm just, I'm controlling the spread. So let's take another shot. Okay. So you'll notice the background gets a lot darker and the flare, the low contrast improves drastically. Now there's still a teeny bit of flare. And what I'd probably do is just finagle with my angle a little bit. So I'm going to do that just to improve it. Let me maybe just move this up just a bit more and angle it. That should be pretty good. Now, if I can move the light out even further out of the frame, that helps. Great. So now I've totally gotten rid of the lens flare that I had. Uh, this actually made me remember another trick is you are likely to run into the biggest problems with lens flare when you're using a wider lens. Your wider field of view is more likely to catch light uh, from all over your scene. So if you have the option, 
you'll notice if you can back up and zoom in, it reduces your likelihood of having lens flare. So try that as well. Uh, even if you're shooting a group, if you can back up just a little zoom in, it's going to help reduce that lens flare. All right, so I got rid of my lens flare, but let's go back to an example, presuming you don't have this space. Because if you look, I backed up my rim light several feet. Well, if you're in a tiny space, you might not have that luxury. So what else can you do? Let's go back, I'll move the light back in and see what we can do to get rid of the lens flare, assuming we're in a tiny space. So let's get rid of the barn door, move it back in, assuming we have a small space. I'm still gonna try to move it at an angle that's not directly back into the lens. So let's try here, but I don't want it to hit her nose, so I'm watching with the modeling light. So probably something around here. Let's give it a shot. Okay, horrible lens flare again. Well, what I said lens flare is created from is it's actually created from the light hitting the lens. Well, one thing I could do is I could add a lens hood. A lens hood is likely to help a little bit with that lens flare. But what I'm likely going to do is if this is as far back as I can move my light and I don't have a modifier and this is all I have to work with, what I'll do is I'll add something called a flag. And basically a flag it's just something to block the light. It flags it out, it blocks it. This could be a piece of uh, black foam core. It, I mean, it really could be anything dark, anything that's not going to reflect the light and you put it in between your light and your camera. I wanna make sure, like in this case, I've got a flag that is made out of absorbent uh, black cloth, so it's not going to bounce the light. I wanna make sure uh, that it's not blocking the light hitting my subject, because obviously, that defeats the purpose, but I want it more in this realm, in between the light and the camera. And all I'm doing is I'm just adding a little bit of shade to the camera's lens. And of course, I don't want it in my shot, so I'm just gonna have to finagle that. Let's try here. We'll see if I need to move it more. Oh, it looks pretty good. Okay, so if you take a look there, I've completely eliminated the lens flare because it basically shaded my lens from the light, but I haven't impeded the light from hitting my subject. So the light in the subject is exactly the way I want it. My light can be very close in and I can still problem solve with those variables in place. So just keep in mind, it doesn't need to be something fancy. Like I said, this one's uh, one that kind of you can set up and it's fabric by Westcott, but just uh, a piece of cardboard that you paint black is going to do the job just as well.